Okay, the main event. So excited. Dr. Matt Lyon is a chiropractor, acupuncturist, and intuitive life strategist to some of the most influential leaders of our time. He has led a very busy and respected wellness clinic here in Charlotte, North Carolina for nearly a decade. He's helped thousands of people regain health and wellness through the principles he teaches and practices. Dr. Matt has been teaching meditation to groups for 27 years. He leads transformative meditation retreats here in both North Carolina and in Jamaica. Uh, holds an honors graduate of the University of uh, Vermont, holds a doctoral degree in chiropractic as well as a master's degree in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. This is supremely creative work. And when we talk about everyone is creative, we mean everyone is creative. We definitely, we've never had someone from this industry or this sector up on our stage before. So it's, I'm super excited that Dr. Matt is the first. Uh, he lives in Charlotte with his wife, Lynn. They're two children. And he randomly speaks fluent Jamaican patois. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak to us on our global theme of restart, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Matt Lyon, everybody. I want to talk about personal restarts, microphone restarts and collective restarts. I believe in every cell of my body that we need to restart, touch the person next to you and say, restart. And I'm gonna tell you ahead of time that the restart, the restart is always in the soul. It's not in the role, the start is in the mind. You know, I think, I think we need a restart personally because statistically there are people in this room that are struggling and hurting, so I know that. I've worked with thousands of people, I know that. But my heart aches for this country right now. We need a restart. And I'm gonna admit, I wanna fully admit and concede that I have a subversive agenda. I'm a revolutionary, but the revolt that I want to catalyze is about love. It's not a revolt that uses force. It's the power of love. It's the power of one. We are one people. You might think I'm trite, but I think love is the answer. Love is the ultimate power, and it is the elixir of the extraordinary. And let's talk about what's become ordinary in this world. Hatred, racism, sexism, misogyny, senseless gun violence. If that has become ordinary, I want to invite the extraordinary. And that happens through the power of love. I want to talk about what's become normal. Normal is that people get their worth based on how many clicks and likes and followers they get. That's, that's become normal. I want super normal. If that's natural, I want to call on the supernatural. And in a restart, I envision a revolution. And it's the power of love. And I want to suggest that when we can understand the mechanics of how we believe and how that informs how we see, we can, from that place of poison strength, spread out seeds of love that can change this world. And I know it can change your life personally. I've done it. And I'll share my story in a minute. Look at what these guys did. Both figures who arose in dark times in their respective places and with courage and backbone, they stood up. They got up and they stood up and they made changes and they moved mountains that changed cultures socially, racially. We stand on their shoulders and I think it's time to continue the work. The power of one is a very real thing. And get this, that the greatest leaders and scientists and visionaries, they are no different and smarter than you. Intellectual capacity, intelligence is not a function of your cognitive capacity. It's a function of your power to imagine. It is your imaginative faculty. The real power of genius is in our ability to dream new worlds and make it so. The thing is, though, is that there's a price to be paid. And the price is that there has to be some work done in the dirt and done in the dark in order for that seed to bloom. Because where is it that seeds bloom? Always in the dark. This is our opportunity. We need to change this world. I know y'all can change yourselves personally, but I have a bigger vision today. 
Are you with me? Okay. So let's get started. We are, not, we are not our roles. All of us play a lot of different roles. We are souls. And so often we think that the restart we need in our life is in the roles. And I think it's in our souls. The real restart is in our mind. And I want to show you the science of that. I want to share my own personal story with that. But the change is in the mind. Touch, to, touch the person next to you and say, it's in my mind. And a restart is not changing. It's not about changing the game you're playing and dressing it up in nicer clothing. It's about, it's about a new game. It's, it's a game changer. And sometimes it's really important that we get dropped into the deep end of our life. And I know there are people who know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes we need to go into the deep end, whether personally or collectively, so that we can discover the very doubts and dysfunctions that have been holding us back all along. Let me tell you a little bit about my story briefly. Three years ago, I woke up one morning and I had a very clear plan how to kill myself. I was gonna end my life. I'd been hurting for a while and I didn't want anybody to know. I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, I felt like a fake. I was a very well-known chiropractor, locally and abroad. I was a meditation teacher. I'd shared the stage with really famous people. I was supposed to have it all together, but I didn't. I'd had this chronic pain that literally had changed my life. I had all these medical challenges that were really difficult to understand. And, and I was like buckling under the weight. And the bigger picture was that the role that I was playing was not consistent and congruent with the soul. I became my role. I forgot my soul. And there were two ways I thought I could end my life so that my daughter, Sienna, wouldn't know. My son, Mikey, hadn't been born yet. I thought there were two ways I could do it so she wouldn't know the shame of suicide in my family. Because you see, my father had attempted suicide. He lived. His father tried and died. So I didn't want to pass that on, but I was stuck in a loop. I was stuck in a generational loop. I needed a restart. So in this moment of darkness, I had a, a lucid moment of clarity, and I hit my knees. And sometimes when you hit rock bottom, that is the best foundation from which to stand up. And I called a friend, and I began to mend. I began to restart. This was for real now. This was my life. This wasn't about being pretty or perfect on a stage. I needed my life back. I discovered, as the poet David White says, that you must learn one thing. This world was made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds except the one to which you belong. And sometimes it takes the darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to show you that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Touch the person next to you and say, restart. And it's, I mean, this is, this is work, right? It's, it's a redirection. It is a recalibration. It is a refurbishing and a reorganization. It is not instant gratification. It is not something that needs to or should look good on Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or whatever apps I do not understand because I'm 42 and I'm now officially too old to get it. <laughs> it is not about playing a better game. It is about changing the game in its entirety. Now listen, I know statistically that there are people here who are struggling you're facing divorce. Your businesses are not working. You are grieving what is going on in this country. We are grieving the shooting in the synagogues, in the yoga studios, in the churches in Texas. We are grieving the loss of what appears to be sanity. There are people here statistically, I know, that are just like I was, that maybe you've thought, I don't wanna be here anymore, but you look good on the outside and things seem to be okay, but you don't know how to talk about it. I know statistically that's the case. The case. The, the good news is, and I know this to be true, is that we are offered one billion chances every moment to restart. I wanna talk about biology. Do you love biology? Do you love 
biology, do you remember? <laughs> caterpillars. A caterpillar is not born to be a caterpillar, N no. It is born with a much more majestic destiny. It is born to become something incredibly, substantially, and miraculously much greater than it was. It is born to be a butterfly, isn't it? Its destiny is not to remain on a twig and hope for a couple leaves and that the best it gets day to day is that a big raven doesn't come and eat it up. Its destiny is to fly. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm, I'm born to fly. <laughs> turn to the person next to you and say, is he going to stop asking me to turn to the next person? <laughs> so here's the thing about caterpillars, though, is A, it does not know its destiny. It doesn't know what resides within. But a life event comes along that changes the game. It changes everything. And to unleash its destiny, it has to go into the dark. It is wrapped in a coffin of a chrysalis in a cocoon. And in that, it literally melts into soup. Soup. But there's something inside that caterpillar. And they're called imaginal cells. What did I say earlier is the mark of genius? It's imagination. Inside that caterpillar are imaginal cells, and encoded in those imaginal cells is the DNA of a destiny that can take it from a caterpillar to a monarch who can migrate from Mexico to Maine. Come on. <laughs> That's the power of the restart, but it's not fun. A Harvard study asked millennials what are your goals? 80% of millennials said, I want to be rich. 50% said, I want to be famous. People, the restart is not about wealth and fame and beauty. It is about changing the game. There is a gift inside everybody in this room. There is a gift inside our current challenge in this country. To get to the other side of the river, I know it's not always easy, but, but I know we can do it. You know, the greatest tragedy in life, said one author, is not death. It's that we die with our dreams inside of us. The richest, wealthiest place in the world is a graveyard because that's where all those dreams are buried. That's where all those restarts are buried. Michelangelo was asked how he made David, and he replied, I just took away everything that was not David. Restart. It's not, about, it's not about making you pretty. It's about making you real. It's about making us authentic. It's about making us genuine. What looks like a crisis is a crossroads where you find the signs to your calling. The, the crisis is a crucible that births a calling. When I was really deep in my struggle, I went back to the faith of my childhood. And this isn't a talk about my faith. But I do want to share that one of the great Jewish prophets said that struck me deeply. He said, Isaiah said, for I am about to do something new. See, listen to me now. See, do you see it? I've already begun. I will make a path through the wilderness and I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So what did I need to make new pathways through? It was my mind. It was my brain. It was my thoughts and my emotions. Because the thoughts you think, you think 70 to 80,000 thoughts per day. Did you know that? Did you know for the average person, 80% of those are negative? I had to make new thoughts through my Mind. The restart is in my mind. It wasn't in my role. It was in my soul because those thoughts and those emotions create my perspectives. Day to day, my perspectives form my attitudes. My attitudes become my beliefs. Turn to the person next to you and say, beliefs. And beliefs are so important because beliefs drive what we do, what we say, how we do it, whom we do it with. And most important, it drives how we see. 
And how many of us, we don't see the possibilities are all around, that are all around us all the time because of our beliefs, because of our bias, because of our bummers, and because of our BS. And in this country, and this is the virus right now in the country, people don't see other people because of their beliefs, their bias, and their BS. Listen, there's some studies that I want to go over briefly. Don't freak out because I said studies. Stay with me. The smartest scientists in the world, they're just very creative. They have amazing imaginations. There was a study done with cats, and I'm really sorry, cat people, but you know you're weird anyway. I mean, <laughs> everybody knows that. So kittens, kittens were separated into two groups. And in one group, these kittens were raised in an environment with only horizontal lines. The other group was raised in an environment with only vertical lines. And after these cats had become wise old kittens, they were put into a normal room. And the cats who were raised with only horizontal lines bumped into anything with a vertical, vert verticality to it. Anybody who was raised with only horizontal lines would bump into anything with a horizontality. That's a new word. <laughs> so they had committed, this is important because the scientists call this premature, cognitive commitments. These cats had committed to a certain version of reality. Their brains had committed to a certain version of reality based on their past. And so they didn't see what was in front of them. How often do we do that? How often do we miss the possibility of a restart? Because we don't see what's there. We keep smacking our head into the same thing. Or perhaps you keep running and walking right past the very person who would help you restart or the very thing, but it doesn't think it is what you're supposed to think it is. Does that make sense? Elephants are cute. Did you know that in India, or in fact, Plaza Midwood, this works too, you can tie an elephant. <laughs> it really does, but only Plaza Midwood. You, you can tie an elephant, a baby elephant, with a very weak chain to a very small tree. And very quickly, that elephant will make a premature cognitive commitment to its own bondage so that when it's an adult, even though this thing is like powerful and majestic and amazing like you, all you have to do is put it in the same environment with the same environmental stimuli, meaning the chain, small chain on a small tree, and it won't move. What have we committed to that blocks our restart? To restart, we, we got to like fix the mind. We want to fix the structure of our life, but the fix is the foundation. We want to dress the windows up, but it's about a renovation in the basement. Stereotypes are pervasive in our society. Yes, raise your hand if you believe this to be true. There is a study done on stereotype susceptibility. Briefly, women were going to take a math test in this study. Half the women were told, take the math test. Half the women were told, take the math test, and they were told a lie, take the math test, but just be informed that women are genetically inferior when it comes to math relative to men. They took the test. The women that were told that they were inferior performed 20% or worse. They performed 20% lower than men on those tests or worse. Stereotypes, beliefs, it's, it's in your mind. Beliefs can change our belief. They, beliefs change our beliefs about our beliefs and they change our behaviors, they change our biology. Sometimes our pain becomes so pervasive that it will block true perception. There was a group of Cambodian women in Long Beach, California, and large groups of Cambodian women were going blind. They lost the ability to see, and yet nothing was medically wrong. Nobody could find out what was wrong. So one researcher said, well, well, let's study. What is the common theme here? The common theme was that they had all emigrated from Cambodia, running from the genocide propagated by the dictator Pol Pot. And they started going blind because they had seen too much. They couldn't bear to see anymore. They had witnessed their children murdered. They had seen their husbands tortured or torturing. They'd seen too much. Their brains literally stopped seeing, even though their bodies were just fine. I've spent 20 
eight years studying the mind-body connection, and it is so real. And as the neuro, uh, a neurophysiologist who got his Nobel Prize said, we don't see reality as it is. We see it as we filled it in from the past. Anais Nin, the amazing poet, said, we don't see things as they are. We see things as? The restart is in your mind. You know, King Solomon, another great Jewish visionary, said that without vision, the people will perish. Without a vision, the people will perish. Our genius is in our capacity to imagine. Without a vision, the people will perish. Vision, seeing, dreaming, imagining. Without it, we break down. And let me take this up a notch and say, when we lose our vision as a culture, inequality and values and love and morals are no longer central in our culture, we break down. We will sell out to a corporatocracy. Yes, I just said that word. We will sell out to a corporatocracy that is really interested in the benefit of a few while overlooking the many. We, we, we need a restart. And in the midst of our restarts, every time it's going to look like we're buried in the darkest places. But I'm submitting to you, I'm proposing to you a different perspective that you haven't been buried. You've been planted. The dirt has got to do its work. And you can't rush the process. Caterpillar goes, you know what? I'm two days into this. I only got 15 likes showing people my new chrysalis. Bail. Sometimes we need serious gumption and grit and grace that you make a commitment to a vision that's greater than your past. I mean, even Moses was told, you're not going to see the end of this, but your people will be free. He did it anyway. Sometimes we have to do it anyway. I had originally wrote this talk because I love quantum physics. It was all this quantum physics stuff, and everybody I tested it on went like this. So I'm going to save you, but I want to share one thing. In quantum physics, we say, and we have a lot of studies to show this, that when you change the way that you look at things, the things that you look at will change. Do you think that's important? Like, there's, the, quantum physics is the most mathematically precise science. You can't refute it. It's just really weird. I'm going to tell you why it's weird in a second. The, the other thing that's so important is when researcher observers have a specific intention about that seeing, it has an even greater effect on the things that it's seeing. It's so interesting. In Israel, there was, at the Physics Institute, they had said that not only... Does how we look at things change the, the things that we look at, but the time and the amount of observation that we put into things changes them. So there was this really smart guy, Dr. John Wheeler. He's a quantum physicist from Princeton University. A smart dude. I would love to have tea with this man. I'll just serve him tea. He said, he literally said that this whole universe, this whole universe is participatory that by the very act of seeing, of observing, of having a vision, we have an impact on reality. So what science was saying is that our subjective internal reality has an effect on objective reality. Isn't that crazy? We are a participatory universe. You think we're separate? The three of us did not put our talks together and make the central theme love. We didn't talk. In fact, I got texts at the last minute. I, didn't, I don't even know what's, where am I? I don't even know where I am, but it all came together. It all came together. We're all connected. I don't think there's a mistake that you're here. I think there's a word for you here from somebody that can help catalyze a revolt on the inside because the change is in your mind. It's in your soul. It's not in your role. So we need to see differently. And I want to share this last piece that Dr. Wheeler said. He said, the mind-bending strangeness of quantum theory is that there is no objective reality out there apart from our observation of it. Now, before, I see, I see like four people having an existential crisis right now. <laughs> Don't, just hold up. If that's true, let's just leave it at that. We can have coffee and talk about the philosophy of that. What could we dream up? Together, what could your life dream up? 
What could your life dream up? What could your body look like? What could your artwork look like? What could your music look like? What could this country look like? What could racial equality look like? What could gender equality look like? What, what could we imagine? What, what did Martin Luther King say? He said, I have a... He had a vision. Without a vision, the people will perish. I have a dream. He saw. What did the prophet Isaiah said? See, I'm about to begin. Do you see it? I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. He had a What did he say? He said, and I quote, I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountain and I have looked and I have seen the promised land. And I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And he knew he wouldn't get there. Moses knew he wouldn't get there with his people, but it happened. Restart. What is possible? In the darkest times, sages, seers, prophets, and visionaries have stood up. They stood up in the darkest times, and they were no different than you. In fact, they look like you. In fact, they are you. They're you. Will you stand up? Stand up. I invite you to stand up. There, it's in our capacity to dream new worlds. I have a dream. I have a dream. We are astral artists painting on a quantum canvas. And nobody owns the title deed to your happiness. Nobody owns the deed to your restart except you. So fix your focus on what's most important. Do you know why people like him were ahead of their time? Because they believed in a vision of a future that was bigger than the memory of their past. And that's all I'm suggesting that we do together as a people. Now I want you to turn to five people around you and high five them or hug them and tell them, I have a dream. I just want to let you know that from my heart, I love you. That's the great thing. That's, that's the great thing about a, a restart in the dark is it will open your heart. And as the great Jewish wisdom said, the, the race is not for the swift, but it's for those who can endure. And together, we can endure. And together, we can dream. And together, we can imagine. I love you. Thank you. Dr. Matt Line, everybody! Hello! Tune into the rhythm of love. Open your eyes. Next month, please join us for our third birthday party, our third birthday party. We're gonna go back where it all started to Laka Projects in Freemore West, and our speaker is gonna be Dr. Stephanie Cooper Luter, the executive director of Leading on Opportunity. And we're gonna be exploring the theme of tradition. So December 7th at 8.30 a.m. at Laka Projects, where it all began, our third birthday party. There'll be some surprises there. Love, love, love. Go out there and restart.